Let's start with something that should stop any serious historian or survival-minded viewer in their tracks. In the late 19th century, long before digital modelling, airflow sensors, laboratory instruments or thermal cameras, a simple cast-iron stove emerged that ran so efficiently that modern engineers still struggle to outperform it in real-world tests. This isn't romantic nostalgia, and it isn't historical myth-making. When researchers in combustion engineering compare traditional stoves to the high-tech units of today, they repeatedly find something humbling. The 19th century base burner, sometimes called the parlor jewel, converts fuel into usable heat with a near-perfect combination of draft control, recirculating airflow and minimal loss. It burned less wood, yet heated larger spaces, held steady temperatures with almost no tending, and could run for 24 hours on a single load. That level of efficiency, without electronics or sensors, should make anyone pause. And that's what this guide is about. The story of why this stove worked, why its principles still outperform modern designs, and why hobbyists, reenactors, off-grid builders and historians keep returning to it, because the engineering isn't outdated. It's simply been forgotten. And if you understand the system behind it, you can apply it not only to antique stove restoration, but also to small homestead heaters emergency heating setups, and long-burn survival stoves today. So let's get into the details with the seriousness the subject deserves. The 19th century base burner succeeds because its entire airflow design is a closed-loop system. The base burner didn't rely on brute force firepower or oversized fireboxes. It relied on circulation. Hot gases were pulled down into the base before rising again, which meant heat that would normally escape straight up the chimney was forced to linger inside the stove's body. That downward draft made each molecule of heat do more work before exiting, something modern stoves struggle to replicate without fans and computer-regulated airflow. In a modern context, if you're building or modifying a wood stove for off-grid use, applying this principle is straightforward. You construct a longer internal gas pathway instead of a straight-through chimney exit. A simple brick baffle, a secondary chamber, or a U-shaped flue path forces the hot gases to travel farther and remain in contact with metal surfaces. Even a basic survival tin can heater can be improved by adding a secondary downward channel and giving the hot air time on the metal, just like the base burner did. This isn't nostalgia. It's thermodynamics. The long, narrow, cast-iron body created sustained radiant heat unmatched by modern thin-walled stoves. Modern stoves tend toward lightweight materials for faster heating, but the base burner was deliberately heavy. A thick cast-iron body soaked up heat and then released it slowly, creating a stable temperature that didn't fluctuate every hour. That stability is one of the reasons it could run through the night without refueling. You can apply the same principle even without cast iron. If you're using a steel stove today, add thermal mass around it using fire brick, stone, or even compacted clay. This does two things. It evens out heat release and increases total usable heat output without increasing fuel use. The 19th century designers didn't have a dozen metals to choose from, but they understood retention better than most modern manufacturers. They weren't trying to heat an Instagram cabin. They were trying to survive winters that killed unprepared families. 
The stove's controlled primary and secondary air feeds created near-complete combustion. This is the part that tends to shock engineers. The base burner often produced efficiency levels close to what we call gasification stoves today. Adjustable intake ports created a precise oxygen flow that allowed the wood to smolder in the lower zones, while vaporized gases burned in the upper zones. In modern terms, they achieve stage combustion without electronics. So, if you want to apply this today, well, you follow the same logic. Create separate zones where the wood breaks down and where the gases ignite. On a DIY heater, this can be as simple as drilling secondary air holes just above the fuel bed or maybe installing a controllable air sleeve that introduces warm oxygen into the upper chamber. When you pull off secondary ignition correctly, you not only reduce smoke, but you know you actually gain more heat from the same log, exactly what the base burner achieved. The mica windows were not decoration. They were early combustion feedback monitors. Most modern users treat stove windows as viewing ports, but mica served a critical function. These windows allowed operators to see how well the secondary burn chamber was functioning. A clean, blue-white flame meant perfect combustion. An orange, rolling flame meant you needed to adjust the draft. This was, in fact, the 19th century equivalent of reading a digital exhaust sensor. Today, if you're operating a modern wood stove, or even a makeshift bush stove, you can use the same observational method. If the flame is lazy and orange, close the primary air slightly and increase secondary air. But if it's roaring and bright yellow, you're losing heat up the flue. You know, camp stoves, homestead stoves, and even those improvised heaters they all benefit from this manual feedback loop, much like Victorian households did back in the day. The stove worked well because it was meant to run continuously, not just in short bursts. Victorian heating culture expected stoves to run day and night, really, which forced designers to optimize for long-duration burn control. The base burner's fuel was loaded vertically, so the fire would consume the wood from bottom to top, creating this slow, predictable feed rate. These days, modern stoves are often designed for those rapid evening heats, but honestly, they tend to sacrifice long burn efficiency. If you're building an emergency heater, or say, preparing an off-grid cabin, you should copy the Victorian practice instead of relying on modern expectations. Use vertical loading where you can. Pack your fuel tightly and let the stove settle into a smouldering stable burn rather than chasing those big flashy flames. Anyone who's ever slept beside a bush stove knows this difference well. The bright flame will heat you up fast but it's the slow smolder that keeps you alive till dawn. The lesson historians and survivalists alike can take from the base burner is this. Good heating isn't about the flame. It's about controlled pathways. The base burner's secret wasn't some mystical bit of forgotten technology. It was a system, really. Slow airflow in a long path through stage combustion, thick walls, and a steady burn. It might look ornate, but all that ornamentation actually hides some of the most intelligent thermal engineering of the 19th century. You know, applying this today doesn't require a Victorian mansion. Honestly, you can incorporate these principles into a small workshop stove, a homestead cabin heater, or even a bug-out location. 
For example, one of the simplest ways to upgrade a shed stove is to add an internal baffle to force smoke downward before it exits. Another step is insulating the firebox roof to create a hotter secondary burn zone. Small changes like these, well, they replicate the base burner's DNA and instantly improve efficiency. You know, the real reason scientists struggle to beat this stove is that, well, modern expectations just don't line up with real-world efficiency. These days, researchers often design for things like emissions, rapid heat, or lightweight portability. But Victorian households demanded something quite different. They wanted reliability over months, minimal tending, low fuel consumption, and a steady heat during those truly brutal winters. And when these priorities are recreated in controlled studies, the base burner's performance, well, it repeatedly surprises modern engineers. And honestly, that's the takeaway here. The 19th century stove wasn't really ahead of its time. It was just, you know, optimised for a world where heat meant survival, not convenience. So, if this kind of deep historical engineering breakdown is the content you want more of, make sure you subscribe to Forgotten Frontlines and share this guide with someone who appreciates serious history and practical knowledge.